But as I'm mm-hmm. falling, falling, the more I'm falling, the more I'm feeling things getting stripped away from me. Meaning such as like hope, love, all the stuff that we take for granted here that we don't realize that come from God, they're stripped from you as you're falling to this place. I'm trying to get up. Then all of a sudden I felt something grab my head and I can see the, the, the claw. This thing had to be huge and it threw me. There is no form of hate here on this planet that can even get close to how they feel about us. They hate you so bad, you can feel it. The energy will kill you. You had a lot of people calling out to God. You had a lot of people asking for five more minutes, one more chance. I felt like I was there for months. Wow. I felt like I was there for months. And I was only wow. there for like three minutes and 40 some seconds, 47 seconds. Where were you shot? In my stomach. Twice. Okay. That's why I'm still I'm still experiencing medical conditions right now. I still have fragments of bullets in me. Hey guys, what's up? Welcome. It's Ranza here from No Christ. Today we have someone very, very special. He's about to share his testimony, a very, very powerful testimony. One that convicted me. One that is the most compelling hell testimony I've heard. One off. Indeed. So I want you guys to just sit back, relax, and uh, get ready. Hey, Dominic, thanks for coming on. Oh, thank you for having me. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank All you right, so I, yes, go ahead. No, no problem. I saw your testimony on, uh, I believe it's called Touch it, on Touching the Afterlife, right? Your wife reached out to me. I, I saw the video yes. on YouTube, but I hadn't clicked on it yet. And then yes. I saw an email from your wife, right? Just sharing your story. And she said, you never wanted to share, but she's like, oh. she's like, you got to share. You got to share it, right? Yes. And then uh, look what's happening. God is using it, right? Yes, definitely. Because at first wow. I, I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't want to share it. I really, for years, I didn't, you know, and I, I don't think, you know, I just think, the Lord put it on my heart. That everything is on his timing, mm. not on our timing. And I want people to realize that everything is on the Lord's timing. And it wasn't time for me years ago to share it because I wouldn't mm. been mature, spiritually mature enough to handle all the things that are coming and the blessings that are coming from the testimony and the testimony, how it was touching others. So I just know yeah. that it was his timing, you know, but um, yeah, I was very reluctant to give my testimony, but I'm glad I did. I want to go all the way back to your story, right? From the beginning. Sure. Well, you know, I'm originally from Chicago, Illinois. Grew up, you know, like I said, with a, a loving grandmother. Um, she was the light of our family. You know, we had, you know, I mean, pretty much she tried to instill God in us, but the neighborhood that we were in, it wasn't, it wasn't fostering of God. It wasn't that way. You know, and my mom went through trauma. My father passed away at a younger age. And, you know, and my mom went down a dark road. She started to use drugs, unfortunately. And with that came for her neglecting me and my brother and sister in a lot of ways. You know, now that I look back on it, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, glad that she did neglect us because I wouldn't have found God to this purpose, you know. And just to throw it out there, my mom has been sober for over 20, 22 years now. So thank the Lord for that, you know. But just starting off growing up in Chicago, it was um, that environment is so hellish. The, a lot of the choices that you have is pretty much the only gang you're going to choose. That is, I mean, your choices are limited, job opportunities are limited. So me growing up in the neighborhood that I grew up, our district has over 500,000 people just in our district alone. So it's always crowded, a lot of gang activity, drugs, and me not having a lot of different role models. And I did. I just didn't have the discernment to see the people around me that I should have followed. But I, I was more following the streets. You know, I was following more of the gang life. I, I wanted the money. I wanted the, you know what I mean? And also I was tired of struggling. So I wanted the fast way out. So um, by the time I was 12 years old, I joined a gang. I don't like to glorify it, so I won't name the gang that I joined because I don't want to give them no credit at all. Um, you know, but I did join the, it's the infamous street gang uh, that's all over the country um, that I joined. And I, I started selling drugs, you know, um, Instantly, I was good at that because one thing about me, I love school. School was always my place of peace. It kept my mind off my neighborhood. It kept my mind off everything. So when I went to school, it was just like peaceful to me. And I always loved to educate myself. So that was that was another thing that I realized God put inside me. But as soon as I got out of school, it's time to put on it's time to put on the war helmet. You know what I mean? It's a yeah. different, different feel to it. But I got pretty fast. I was very smart. So I, I was very intelligent. And learning how to sell drugs, moved up fast in the rankings because of my intelligence, but I was using my intelligence for the wrong things. You know, I used it for the dark side. Manipulation, you know, uh, especially when it comes to the women, like I say, money, everything. It was just my whole focus and my aim was just totally, totally off. Because in our culture, we're programmed to worship and idolize certain things. What quote makes you a man, you know what I mean? You know, and, and that's not the case, but I thought I was becoming a man. I thought 
me, you know, having a status in a gang. I thought me having money, you know, people being scared of me, me being to shoot guns. I thought that made me a man. And um, so the more I thought that, the more, of course, I was hungry and enticed to live that type of lifestyle. There's one thing I wanted to touch on. You said when you were younger, some of your family members were involved in like uh, Santeria, Santeria. etc. Oh, and you yes. saw something. Definitely. You saw something when you were a young boy. So tell us about that if you want to share it. Uh, this uh, ceremony thing, if you want to go into it. Well, there's there are ceremonies in Santeria in the culture, you know, Cuban culture, Latin culture, Dominican culture. They call it sweats. Okay. And when I was younger, I went to a sweat and that's where they, they pinch a tent and they, they burn, they, they burn hot stoves and you pretty much almost naked. And the, the whole tension is to give all the spirits a chance to come through you and in you. And, um, yeah, this is, uh, yeah, that's why I knew the spirit realm is real. That's why I knew demons are real. But when I was young, I didn't know those were demons. Well, you, you, you're packed. I was packed inside this, this tent and they're, they're praying to, okay. One thing I want people to know. In Santeria, there are nine principalities, okay? And these nine principalities are the principalities that run the whole world. And what happens is uh, each year, at the end of each year, they shift different places. So each principality takes over a new territory on the earth. And when this happens, you give praise and worship to these new principalities that shift positions. And a lot of people, when we have these sweats, it is an honor of the new principality ushering in that new principality that's coming in over a certain, a certain territory. Okay, now on this occasion, I was in a sweat, a ceremony, and there were just tons of just uh, uh, rocks. It's an it's a, it's a altar, okay? It's a form of an altar, but it's an altar. And you know, you get to a point of it, and everyone's chanting and chanting. And I, I don't want to say those names because people don't realize when you say these demonic names, they actually can come into your life from your portal. So I'm just gonna say one of these principalities were being ushered in to the, to the sweat ceremony to the ritual and as i'm looking there was the altar in this altar of hot stones that's what gives off the heat to make everybody sweat but this stones the smoke that was coming from it started to become solid okay now as i'm looking at it becoming solid it started to form of the shape of a body you can start to see the legs the upper body the arms and I, i'm looking like wait a minute am i seeing I had to re, you know, kind of focus my eyes, but the more I'm looking at it, this thing is solidifying, it's becoming solid, okay? And now you can start clearly see a form of a young, beautiful lady. I mean, one of the most beautiful ladies I've ever seen in my life, I'm not gonna lie to you, but she just started manifesting into a solid form, okay? Even then you can start to see the color. She had a white robe on. She was pretty much like my complexion, maybe a little darker, long, uh, silky hair, but she completely formed out of smoke. And one thing, yes, this is this is this into like, a real body, into a physical into a body, physical, physical body. OK. And one of the high priests that came up, grabbed her hand and she stepped out of from the smoke down and they said, welcome, sister. Thank you for coming and joining us today. But I was so petrified that I squirmed my way through this ceremony and just took off running. I mean, I took off. Yeah, I, I couldn't even because it's a it, it remind me of the same fear. Spiritual fear and physical fear are two different elements. Mm. It's way more magnified. That's why some people can who, who get haunted by demonic forces and things. It's a different terror. It's not even fear. It's outside the realm of regular fear that, that we experience here on Earth. It's outside this dimension. That's why it's more powerful. Okay. Well, that that's that that was just one incident, and we could talk more about that. But um, you were a little boy at this time. Like, how old were yes, you at this time? I was nine years old. Okay. Okay. So let's fa fast forward back to gang life. You're doing all that, right? Yes. Uh, you, your wife also said that you were uh, just searching for religions, like searching for truth. You know, yes, looking I was into different things. Yeah, my family can vouch for that. I I was. It just always had a compelling to form with God. That's why I was Muslim. I was a Black Hebrew Israelite. You know, uh, like I said, Santeria, New Age movement. I did so much research over the years trying to find him. And the funny part was he was with me the whole time. <laughs> mm. While I was out there looking for all of these things, that's what people don't realize. While you're out there mm. searching and trying to search, whenever, whenever you have an inkling to find him, that means he's already found you. Uh, okay, okay, See okay. I mean? He's right. They're just waiting, like waiting for you. So he's did already, you... Yeah, he's already there. So it's, it's did... yeah. Did you look into Christianity? I thought it was a hoax. I thought it was a, um, I'm, I'm just being honest. This is just, I'll keep it 100 as we say. Um, 
Yeah, I thought it was a hoax. I thought it was just a fear tactic. I thought it was just used to manipulate and control people. I thought it was a European white man's religion. You know what I mean? Come to find out, actually, it's an ancient African religion. It started, you know, but that's a whole other story. That's, yeah, it, it was never a European religion, but that's what the enemy puts on our mind because we're so used to just searching the details on things, we lose the message on things. We want to know the scientific principles of things, the historical facts, the archaeological principles, instead of the spiritual message that's coming in that package. So that's another tactic to throw you off from getting to the message. Instead of you arguing and debating with people on the outside of things, you never get his message. So that's, yeah, yeah. That's why I want people to be careful with overanalyzing the historical facts of things. We know man, mankind and man tampered with things. We know this. We know the man tampered with the scriptures. I don't know how many times. That's why there's so many different versions. But when you when you have discernment, you only can water down God's word so much. But once you have true discernment, you can see instantly his power is still in the scriptures, no matter who try to manipulate. Man only can do so much to God's word. So, yeah, I just wanted to add that in there. Yeah. So we're coming up to the moment now where uh, you were shot. Yes. Right? And then you had oh, the experience, yeah. right? Lead us up to the moment where you got shot and then sure. what happened after that? Sure. It was uh, 2009. By then I, I was, I had some money and you know, every weekend we go to the clubs, we go to the clubs looking for girls we are smoking some weed, we're drinking in their life. Right? So for us, it's a tradition to go get new clothes. You go to the club, you got to have a new outfit. So me and my friend, we're going to go shopping during the day. We go shopping, but I kept seeing this one guy. Okay. First, we went to the clothing store. I come out, he's sitting on his car. And this is something in my spirit says, something is not right about this guy. But I looked at him, he said, what's up? And he said, okay, what's up? We go to another store. I come out, he's outside the second store, way on the other, other side of our district. It's just like, there's it's, it's no way you can keep running to the same person. So I thought it was, wait a minute. You now my spirit really was tugging on me. Like something is up with this guy. So again, I looked and he said, he's sitting on his car outside of the store. So I tapped my friend and said, hey man, this man is following us. This guy, and my friend laughed. He was like, dude, you're not that important. Nobody following you, man. Quit quit it. Nobody, you're, you're nobody to be thinking about. Stop it. You're paranoid. Okay, I brushed it off. So later on, I come out two or three hours later, we're dressed, I'm ready to go out. I come outside the building. Guess who's standing there? The same guy. So this time I said, okay, I'm about to question this guy and ask him, do I know him from somewhere? Where is he from? You know what I mean? Because it, it, enough is enough at this point. I, my spirit is telling me I need to find out what's going on. As I'm walking and approaching the guy, he had a cigar in his mouth. And he said, do you have a light, a lighter on you? I said, yeah. And so as I'm reaching in my pocket, I saw a green flash. It's the first thing I, I, I really remember. It was a green flash. Okay. Now, it just seems like, I don't know if, it, you know, things go in slow motion. You know, when your body um, experience traumatic experiences, mm -hmm. you know, you either black out or time slows down for you. Okay. And I'm, I'm noticing how God put that in as a safety mechanism for your body, for us. So we won't be over traumatized by the experience. But as I look up, I smell like, uh, I don't know if you know, you know what matches, like mm -hmm. if you were burn a whole book of matches, like the sulfuric smell. Yeah. That's what I smell. But as I look up to him. And I, he hit me again, wow, again. So now I, I'm looking at him, but he has this look on his face and it was demonic, but it was like a, I got you look like a, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. mm, I, you know what I mean? I, and, but as I, the second time I fall back, but as soon as I'm falling back, I feel myself falling forward. Okay. It's hard to explain. I'm falling back, but yet I can feel myself falling forward and instantly, it was instantaneous. It was just like that. I was in darkness, but like I described before, this darkness is not a darkness like here on earth. It's not, it's not like you can blindfold yourself. Like you can put yourself underneath the earth, super blindfold yourself and dig deeper. And it's still, this darkness is alive. You understand? It, it is, it had a spiritual component to it, to where I felt that it was all over me. Like it was holding me, but as I'm falling down, it's, it, I mean, I can't even calculate the speed. But as I'm mm -hmm. falling, falling, the more I'm falling, the more I'm feeling things getting stripped away from me. Meaning such as like hope, you know, love, all the stuff that we take for granted here that we don't realize that come from God, they're stripped from you as you're falling to this place. Okay. I want people to be aware. Don't take anything for granted because as I was falling, 
it's beyond. Like I was saying before, uh, at first, the terror is not fear. It's terror, and it's alive. It is really, it's a spirit. It's alive in that place. In the darkness, it's alive. It was alive. It was like the darkness had a consciousness of its own, and it was stripping me of everything good. So as I'm falling, 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 I mean, it's so fast, and I I, I can't even think clear, but I just, I, I'm falling because people don't understand just say, for example, if you're here conscious, like we're talking right now, we're communicating, and then all of a sudden you're taken to another, just a whole other place instantly. It's instantaneous. There's no slow build up to it. There's no nothing. There. It's boom. Okay. And I'm falling. And, I, and I'm feeling this fear, but the speed of the fallingness, it, it is, uh, it's, I can't even explain it in words, no matter what language, no matter wow. what. It's spiritual. It's a spiritual component to everything. Now that in hindsight, the more that I'm mature in my spirit, I'm realizing that it is all spiritual. The spiritual life, I was in my spiritual body, okay? I'm falling. Now, the first thing that hit me was this smell. The smell. You see, people don't understand. I'm going to explain it again. When, when you pass away, you don't lose your five senses. You know, sight, hear, touch, taste. No, no. They heightened. They get more potent. So they like they 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 raise times a million. So you become more sensitive. You be they don't go anywhere. They get stronger. Mm. So like if this smell, if you were to smell this smell right now, the smell that I was smelling, there's no way your body would be able to take it here on this earth. Mm. There's no sewer, no dead bodies, no 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 dead animals, rotting flesh. There's nothing that can compare to this smell. Okay, it is so bad. It is just. But as I'm falling, I'm. Just like it's just overwhelming the smell, and then all of a sudden I see a little light. It's a little, little light because this darkness is so dark. You can see the light on a uh, like a top of a pinhead. You can, it's bright mm -hmm. compared to this darkness. So to see mm -hmm. that little light, I'm I'm thinking, but as I'm going, I'm falling, falling. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Then all of a sudden I felt heat. I can feel heat coming from this light. But I wasn't even so I, now that I'm looking at it, I wasn't even paying attention to the heat because I was so scared. I'm smelling this smell, but I'm starting to see it looking like a big portal. But this portal looked like it was rocks. OK, that's what I want to explain to people. Hell is, he, is here on Earth, but it's in a different dimension. OK, just like when I when I start learning uh, scientific principles on different dimensions, it makes complete sense. It's like I'm sitting here right now, but there's different frequencies going through me that I can't even see, like microwaves, radio waves, all types of things, but they're vibrating on a different frequency. So you can have two places in one space because of different dimensions. So hell is on earth, but it's in a different dimension. All right. Yes. So now as I'm falling and I'm seeing this, this portal and it's open, as it opened, now it's, I'm pretty much right there and I can see the every detail. Now, remember, your senses are heightened. You can see a molecule if you wanted to, if you focus and zoom in on it. I mean, that's how pinpoint accurate your senses are in a spiritual body. Now, I'm looking, and it's rocks, like stones, ancient rocks, caverns. But I fall through, and I hit the bottom. Now, when I hit the bottom... So the opening the opening is like like rocks? Yes. Like circular? It's like, okay. it's like you're entering the cave system. Okay. It's like I was falling into an ancient cave system. That's the best okay. way I can describe it. But the rocks were glowing. Everything on the rocks was so hot. They were like yellow, orange, white. They were hot. They were so heated. That's why that's the little light that I was seeing. When, when I got there, I knew exactly that was that opening. So when I hit the bottom, I mean, I slammed so hard. But I didn't even feel that pain like that. Because when I tried to move, I was so more worried. I was like... Um, I was I was just panicking so bad. I tried to move and I couldn't move the way we move here. It felt like I was wearing a big heavy suit, like I was weighed like 900 pounds. So just like I'm moving my arms now and I can do this and that. No, 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 no. First of all, you feel like instantly I felt I had no energy. I had no energy. And what that was now that I realize is that we're so used to being in our physical body we're so used to things of our physical nature. Like I couldn't breathe when I was trying to breathe. It was, it was like the look, like I couldn't even breathe. It's because I wasn't breathing in the first place. There's no oxygen in that place. But we're so used to being here, just like we're breathing now. We're unconsciously breathing. So I thought I was trying to breathe. So that makes my anxiety there even worse because you're so used to being in this flesh. 
You think you have fleshly movement? It doesn't work that way. You're stripped of everything. Remember, you're stripped of everything God gave you. So even having movement, even th that comes from God. See, we don't realize that. Even breathing and just feeling, ref that comes from God. But that was stripped. You get stripped of all of that when you, by the time you make it there. Were you were you thinking about outside at all? Or you, no, like you weren't even no, thinking about the earth? No. You were just you don't focused on this place. Yeah. You, you don't, you don't, you're so petrified. You're so scared. You're not thinking about anything here. You're not thinking about a person. You're not thinking at that moment. You're not thinking about anything. I was so shocked and going through in the fear and the anxiety and just everything. You're not thinking that's the last thing you're thinking about. You're not thinking about any, any of those things. So when you realize where you were, what happened next? I'm trying to get up and it was so dark. She was just as dark, but all of a sudden, the only thing that illuminated that place, the first thing I saw before me were the pits. And they were like, flames are coming up. And then you can see when these flames come up, that's how you can see. But when the first pit lit up, I saw it had to be thousands, as far as your eye can see, of these pits. And they were connected in rows, but they would go so far. Like, I mean, it had to be miles and miles and miles of these pits. But inside these pits, there were people, okay? But what really caught my attention, before I describe the people in the pits, were these beasts around all the pits. They were like giants. Some of them were like, and they all had a, like a reptilian kind of theme to them. They all looked like reptile, nasty, deformed. Some of them had long arms, short arm with a long arm, bodies. But the ones, the giants that I saw, some of them had to be like 18, 13 to 18 feet tall. I mean, huge. I'm, I'm talking about ripped up muscles, huge. I mean, they like were humanoid. Were they humanoid? Humanoid, like yes. They had legs. They had arms. They had, you know, chest uh, uh, muscles. They had, they were very humanoid, but not even close to humans. <laughs> not even, they were so ugly. And they, st the smell that I was smelling, they stink. Okay. It was them. It was them. Like they, yeah, they stink. They, they horrible smell to them. Horrible smell. And a lot of them smell like sulfur too. Like that's why a lot of people who I've talked to who had experiences with demons, they always smell like a sulfuric smell. They stink. They smell bad. They smell there. Yeah, they're horrible. But then I saw also saw demons as tall as this pen. They small. You got some, they all sizes, all shapes, all sizes. But they had some of them had red eyes, some of them had yellow eyes with the slits in them. You know, and some of their skins were scaly. Like I said, they had that reptile, like the reptilian type look. But some of them didn't have the, the reptile look. Some of them were just so deformed and ugly, hairy. It just, it just didn't make sense. Some of them were just so disproportionate. It didn't make any sense. Did they notice you when you when you fell? No, not right away. Not right away. One of them did, and that's how that's how I look back because I never saw the Lord. I never saw the Lord. But now that I look back, He had to be with me to be protecting me because okay. the, the, the hatred that they have for us, it is beyond description. It is beyond words. They hate, there's no form of hate here on this planet that can even get close to how they feel about us. They hate you so bad. You can feel it. The energy will kill you. If they hatred was in a form of a weapon here on earth, you would die. You would die. They hate. When I say hate, hate is an understatement. Hate would feel like love compared to the hatred that they have for us, literally. Yeah. But as I looked at the pits and the people, some of them were like charred skeletons, charred, burned up skeletons. Some of them had flesh hanging off of them. Okay. And the thing is, they were trying to crawl out. And now, I mean, because uh, once you get there, you know that you know. You know. You know pretty much everything. You can see a person in hell and know why they're there. There's no time there. There's no time that you have to take to learn because everything is connected. So you know that you know. And they were there to guard the people from coming out the pit. They had these spears and these ancient things and people were trying to crawl out. They were sticking them, grabbing them, especially the big giant grabbing them and throwing them right back into the pits and the lava. I mean, and then what got me though, like I was saying before, I, I, I forgot to mention was the screams. The screams and the yells, okay, it moves your spirit. It, mm -hmm. the, 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 the sense of the way these people were screaming and in agony and the regret and the pain, it is beyond comprehension. Even right now as we speak, 
that place is going on right now. And that's what reminds me every day. It's happening right now as we speak. People are there right now. And it's so many people. It is it is so, so many people. But as I'm trying to get up and I look, and I'm looking at these pits and I'm just, now I thought I was already scared and full of anxiety. Now it's just beyond. It see, it keeps growing. There's no, there's no limit to fear in the spiritual realm. Just when you think, okay, this is the I'm maxed out of my anxiety. I'm maxed out of my no, 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 no. It keeps growing and it doesn't stop. There's no limit to how fearful you become. You know, I'm trying to get up. Then all of a sudden I felt something grab my head and I can see the 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 claw. This thing had to be huge and it threw me. And when it threw me, I mean the the strength of this thing, it was like me picking up this pen and throwing this pen. It was like it was nothing. So I don't care what people say, oh, I will go in down there and I'll fight. No, nah, I'm sorry. No, it's not happening. You, I don't care if you're the strongest man on earth. You ain't got, you have nothing. It's like you had, you had no control, right? You, you no, have no control. You have no control. You have no strength. It's like you didn't eat in months. You don't have no, no nutrients, no kind of muscle, none of that. That's out the window. That comes from God. And everything, that, nope, that's not there. So you can try your best if you want to, and it's nothing going to happen. So as I got playing, I got hit this wall. But now as I, I'm, I notice as I once again, I, Lord had to be with me because I didn't feel because of the force that I was thrown. I I I would have felt. I knew I was going to feel the pain because one thing I'm going to explain to everyone, like I, I explained before, my testimony is that here on the body we have a nervous system, right? So if I was to touch you and, and just pinch your hand, you would feel it only on your hand. In the spirit world. There's no such thing. If you get hit in the hand, you feel it through your whole body simultaneously at the same time. Mm. You won't feel it just in an isolated place where you got pinched. You will feel it all at one time from your head. So to pain your, also is more intense as well. By a million. By a million. And that's an understatement. It, it, it is because the spiritual world is way people don't understand. Everything here physical is the leftovers from the spiritual world. That's why the Lord said your thoughts are more realer. That's why you get judged by your thoughts. Because that's what the real is. It's not, your action is just a reflex of your thoughts. So now I know what the Lord means by that because the spiritual is way more realer than this. Everything here physical is leftovers from the spiritual world. That's why I say the pain is more real. Your senses are more heightened. Everything is more intense, way more intense. Okay. Now that's why I say when I got flung and I saw, I knew the Lord was there with me. Is because I didn't feel, I, I expected so much more pain, but it wasn't, it wasn't. I, I felt pain, but it wasn't what I knew in my mind where I was calculating that it should be. But as I look up, I'm on the side and it's like a stone mountain, but in the mountain were jail cells, rows and rows of these cells as far as your eye can see up. Like, and I grew up in skyscrapers my whole life and I know what it is to live in the sky. Literally, but these things were so high, like they were built into the side of a mountain and there were rows and rows of cells, like the old cells, not like the modern day jails with the door, with the slit. No, the bars and they look ancient, rusty, but instantly I knew all of a sudden I started looking and you can see people, activities and all of these different cells. And then it would be like three feet apart. It'd be stones, another cell, stones, another cell, stone, three feet apart, like just, just estimating. Three to two and all the way up. All the way up. The same way I saw the pits all the way going across, these were all the way up as far as my eyes can see. Literally. Like, I couldn't even see it no more, but you can still see cells, cells, cells. And instantly I knew these were ancient. I knew that the people were in there were there for thousands of years. Thousands of years. I mean, I'm talking about biblical times. They've been in there since. You know, people can't even imagine because time, see, like we're so used to time here. You can't imagine no time. There is no time there. Time stops. There is no time in the spirit world. It's no, it doesn't exist. Time is only used in the physical manifestation for us to organize things and keep schedules. It doesn't exist. All hope is gone when you're there. There is no, at least, like, for example, I was explaining. Back when I used to live my, my back life, because I did go to jail a couple of times. I was in jail, okay? I had hope because I had an out date, right? So you say, okay, I'm getting released in eight months. 
that gives you some hope that I'm getting out of here in eight months. But when you're in hell, there is no outdate. There is no time. There is nothing to, no schedule. There is none that, that's gone. You know you're there. And the worst part is, I knew I deserved to be there. That was the thing that really got me. I had no rebuttals for me not being there. Okay? So you, were, you weren't crying for mercy? You weren't calling out to God? Nothing like that? No? No. No. And that's another thing. See, the people don't understand. The, the things that I were hearing, you had a lot of people calling out to God. You had a lot of people asking for five more minutes, one more chance. Please, I'm sorry. Let me make it up so you can hear everything. That's another thing I want to add. Remember I was talking about the five senses being high. You can hear everybody screaming at one time, but you can individualize every person. You can individualize every scream. You can individualize. But then I heard a lot of blasphemous things towards God. I heard a lot of anger. A lot of cursing God out. I heard a lot of like, yeah, big time. People were angry. Only people were making sounds. The demons weren't making any sounds or whatever oh, those creatures no. were. Demons, were. Yeah. Oh, that, that was, I was going to get to that. When the demons were communicating with each other, they have their own language. And that whole language hurt my body every time they talked. Mm. Every time they so, talked. So you never understood what they were, what they were saying? Oh, yeah. You understand everything. I'm going to use okay. the term. You overstand everything that they sang. What they was communicating back and forth, they were calling us stupid humans. When they were grabbing and torturing humans and doing all type of things, they were calling us stupid and they were laughing. They love, they laugh, they enjoy. Because what I found out and what I saw myself through my experience is that they get energy off our pain. They eat it. It's a form of food to them. It's a, like a drug to them. They get high off of it. That's why they're here on earth. They keep us depressed, angry full of anxiety because they're feeding off that. That's their food. They literally eat that. So they cause situations for you to feel that way so they can eat. They literally, they eat off that. And in hell, they have an abundance, nonstop supply of food because all they do is torture. They say if your arm gets ripped off, your arm will grow right back. Rejuvenate. And it happens over and over and over again. Like I say, I saw tons of people there where they were ripping over their mouth and pouring hot lava down their throats. They'll melt and they'll come right back and they'll do it all over again. And then they'll invite other demons to come and get their turn. Like I was also mentioning about uh, promiscuous women who were there and men. But I saw my experience. I saw majority of what I saw with the women being raped by demons. This one lady was being raped and tortured so bad sexually that I'm not going to say it on here, but it's beyond horrible. But I'm, I'm talking about, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's it's. And then some of the tortures are so bad, I, I still, to this day, I can, I can smell a certain smell, especially matches. I don't like the smell of matches at all because it brings me back to that. It makes, it reminds me of that. Yeah, it, it does. Like PTSD big time. I don't, I don't, I don't like that. But your wife said you said something about, um, I think it wasn't the, the last one I listened to actually. You said uh, you saw pastors and, and, and people like that there. Could you yeah. explain? Yes. You know what? And there's, I saw and they, and a lot of them were still dressed in suits. Okay. There was like a cavern, like a cave. And they were, a lot of them were just sitting there like they were waiting where the demons would come in, especially the giant ones and snatch them up and throw them in boxes. They were throwing these pastors in boxes. They had all types of stuff for them. They had all types of like, they had a field day with the pastors, the fake past. I, I, I'm going to be honest. A lot of them were just mu misusing their authority that God gave them. Okay. Um, and he, they, okay. For one example, they threw this one pastor in a box and it was an old nasty box, but the box was filled with hot coals in it. So when they throw them in it and they close it, you can hear, I mean, the screams are beyond like, you can feel it. You can feel the, yeah, it's just the anguish and the pain. And they were throwing these things in them. They were stabbing this. They, yeah, they were ripping people apart. They were eating people, especially the pastors. They had a, like they had a real real good time with them. They were enjoying, like, really. A lot of people who I saw were a part of the church. Like I said, you can look you can look at somebody in hell and know why they're there. There's no ifs and about it, about it. Like, if somebody was to look at me, they'll know why I was there. The people that were in church, mm -hmm. uh, what were some of the sins that they did? Like, that I, saw actually... more, I saw more gossipers in hell than anything from the church. Wow. Gossip, backstabbing, lust in the church, right? But the most of all was the gossip, gossiping, because people don't understand the power of gossip. 
They, they don't understand how powerful it is, how you can hurt somebody's life for just, you know what I mean? It was so many people down there for gossiping, you know? They smile in your face, but then, oh, look at Sister Clark, or look at Brother so-and-so, but then you're in church praying with them instead of praying for them. See, when you talk about somebody's problem, you better have a solution. If not, it's gossip. Mm. Plain and simple. If you're going to talk about someone's problem, you better be willing to help that person. If not, don't talk about it and stay out of their business because that's serious. God doesn't play with gossip. And I, <clears throat> and I saw that firsthand. God does not play when it comes to gossip. And the, the pastors that were there, were they like uh, like fake pastors in the sense of yeah. like, what were they doing exactly? Like, call what it did pop, they do? They were popcorn Christians. What I mean by popcorn Christianity is the term that me and my friends came up with is because they're, 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 they're okay, like a popcorn kernel is hard, right? A kernel of popcorn. But when you apply heat to it, it puffs up and it turns soft. That's what they were. They were acting like they were really hardened for the Lord, that they were really solid. But then the heat and the pressures of the world turned them soft and they became worldly. Okay. And they're fake. So worldliness. Yes. Mm. And then a lot of them are, like I always say, intellectual parrots, meaning they, they, they know the scriptures inside and out. They sound good. They, they sound intellectual, but they don't live them. They don't live them. They fool the people. That's why I tell the people, it's not up to the pastor or your deacon or your bishop to establish your personal relationship with the Lord. That's up to you because a relationship with the Lord is ultra personal. It's not their responsibility. And you can be, even the Lord says, don't follow a man because you never know who you are following. So why they think, oh yeah, brother told me to do this or sisters told me to do this. And yeah, they're a man or woman of God. They lead you right to hell. Wow. Because you don't have- I, I heard you said to. unforgiveness too. You said unforgiveness too, right? I was going to mention that next. The top two, the top one is gossip. The next one is uh, unforgiveness. You know how many people say, I forgive, but I won't forget? That's not forgiveness. See, when God forgives us, it's deleted from the universe. It's gone. He doesn't remember, clearly doesn't remember. You can try to say, hey, Lord, remember I did this? He's going to say, what are you talking about? Because it's been deleted from his heart. We don't do that. We say we forgive you and still have in the back of our mind reservations and judge that person and still kind of say, I'm just going to, you know, and what? And I saw so many people there for that. See, people don't understand. Yeah, they, you see, we unqualify and disqualify ourselves from going to paradise. Paradise in heaven cannot have one ounce of filth in it. If so, you will corrupt it. So that's why we need the Lord as a mediator to make sure he washes us from that. Because we're all imperfect. We're going to fall. We're going to have flaws. But our relationship with him and his grace, he washes us clean from that so we can enter paradise. Because you cannot have one blemish on you. It's like if you have a fresh basket of apples and you put one in with a little mold on it, what's going to happen to the rest of those apples? The whole Imagine. bunch is going to be spoiled. Exactly. So therefore, we disqualify ourselves from getting into heaven because we're so blemished. And then we think we can do it on our own. We can't do it without him. There's no way we can cleanse ourselves the way we need to be cleansed to be on that frequency of heaven. So we disqualify ourselves all the time. Some people would say, that, they would say, well, well, you know what? Um, once they're covered, they're covered. And, you know, like the pastor, for instance, <laughs> he's okay. Even if he mess up, you know, like he's covered past, present, future sin. And the other gossipers or un people, unforgiveness right. is fine because uh -huh. you're covered. Sure. And, and that's something that people say. Like I saw another testimony of a pastor in Africa, very, very gripping health testimony. Mm -hmm. He said, it was unforgiveness that caused him to go to hell. See, and that's what I'm saying. And those who say that, they obviously don't read the scriptures. Because clearly in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 says, if you commit a sin and there know, and you know thereof that it's a sin, there is no sacrifice that can save you. See, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. So all that uh, once saved, always saved, that comes from the pits of hell itself. It's a lie. It's a lie. If that's the case, I might as well go back to the life I used to live. I got saved, so I might as well just go, let's go kick it, man. You know, hey, let's go have fun. Let's go do what we need to do then. 
those are fighting words, right? Because yeah. um, in, in, in health testimonies, you always have people in the comment section that talk about that, right? Mm -hmm. They always talk about it. Even when I shared my outer darkness experience. So when you spoke about the little pin, the light, I saw that. My thing was just like this pitch black place that looks like a cave, right? I found myself in this place. Mm -hmm. And when I realized, just like you said, the hopelessness, there was a palpable sense of, as you said, you cannot get out. You knew, you know that yeah. you're stuck there forever. Yes. And this, this hopelessness was beyond anything I can describe. And when yeah. I, when I realized where I was, I cried out for Jesus. And then I saw a little light, like a little pinprick of light mm -hmm. way out in the distance. And I yep. bolted to it. And when I jumped through the light, that's when I leaped out of like my bed. And that was, it's a very traumatic exp experience for me. Like, so I, I, I understand. Yes. Some of the I, things just, I never experienced what you experienced, but I got a little glimpse of the outer darkness. And that was enough for me to understand that it's not something to be messed with. And yes. I was a Christian. Right. <laughs> right. I was a believer at the time, but I was right. lukewarm. Yep. I was a lukewarm believer at the time. But continuing yeah. from, you, you saw the bars and you saw people inside the bars and the ancient, like some people from yeah. like way back when. Yeah, from from ancient there. Persia all over. You you can clearly see, you can clearly tell like these things and these people were just there for thousands and thousands of years. Even the garbs they were wearing, some of them were skeletons. Some of them, like I said, were just like ancient. But the the, the color of their flesh was like a smoky gray darkness it wasn't you can't tell what race they were only by their features but they were from all over but they were very very ancient and i knew they were there for astrology witchcraft this this like the whole all of them were there for worshiping other gods worshiping Baal, worshiping demons like all of this was like a dedicated section to ancient those ancient ones who were worshiping other false gods and then let other people to worship false gods See, it's, it's one thing that when you sin alone, cool, that's bad enough. But when you bring others to sin with you, when you become contagious and you're sinning, it's way worse. You have way worse judgment that falls upon your head. So that's what I say. Hey, if people make your own choice, but don't bring nobody with you. Don't make nobody fall with you because you're going to be held accountable, not only for yours, but for theirs as well. So what was some of the regret, like some of the things that they were saying, like, you know, like uh, that they were sorry about? Stuff like that. Regret. This is it because I had the regret. I had the review. I call it the great review because it comes a moment when you're in there where I, I, he shows you every detail, every conversation that you heard someone that you didn't even see and how that causes a ripple effect in their life. Every bad thing I did for even still in the candy bar when I was seven years old to every detail that you ever did. Now, I don't know if people remember in the Bible, it says your own flesh will testify against you. See, so I, my own flesh was testifying against me to me. And that's what I had the feeling that I have no right to get out of here. That's when I had the feeling that, you know what? I deserve this. That, that was when I came with a feeling, overwhelming feeling where it hit me that, dang, I deserve to be here. There's no way I'm getting out of here because you have so many people screaming. Please let me make it up to her or let me make it up to him. Give me one more chance to go say, you know, like it was just so many things of regret that they wish they can do one more time to make things up to people. The things that they said to people, the things they physically did to people, the things that they stole from people, the thoughts that they were thinking about people, the gossip that they did someone and made someone lose their job or lose their reputation because of gossip. Even false gossip is even worse. When you just make up things about somebody because you're jealous of them. There's a lot of people with the spirit of jealousy. See, hell is very organized and people don't realize this. Hell is so organized. It has a spirit for everything. A spirit for everything that you think is just you. No, a lot of the times, okay, I'm, I'm going to say this loud and clear. Everyone is accountable, okay? Your flesh, you're accountable for your own actions. So I'm not going to blame everything on demons. I'm not going to blame everything on the devil because we do have accountability and responsibility for ourselves. But what I am saying is they don't have the power to make you do anything. But they, what they do, they're great manipulators and they're great influencers. So they, and your flesh by default will go with the choice of the demons by default because your flesh is so weak. So they know how to manipulate your flesh to make these decisions. You see them? You see what I mean? So people need to realize that. But then, back to answering your question, the most things, like I said, that I was hearing them say is they just don't want one more chance to get it right. They want one more opportunity to make things right. You know, 
And it, it was just like if some of them are asking for 30 seconds to be on the earth. I don't know what somebody can accomplish in 30 seconds, but I mean, they're asking for time. They're just asking, can I just go tell this person, I'm sorry what I did to my mother. I'm sorry what I did to like, you know what I mean? You know, it, it's just, yeah, it's just so many, so many voices from so many different levels. And all we have to do is apply our own experience to answer, to answer that question. But I don't want to wait again till I pass away again to make anything right with someone. We need to do it right now while you're here on this earth. Amen. What happened after the the bars, right? Because I, I remember you said you were on a cliff after or something like that. Yeah, that was towards the end. I'm just going to wrap it. Yeah, because when I went, this is towards the end. It was a lot more in between that. But we can, maybe another time, God willing, I can come on a platform and explain. But I was on a cliff, okay? And it was people on the right side, people on the left side. But when I looked, it was a desolate forest. And it was a path in the forest. But these trees, it wasn't a regular forest. These trees were dead. These trees were, it was just like a dead forest. And it was black sands, black and gray sands. Okay. But when I looked further up, that's when my, like, I really, I felt this place. The whole time, I was in hell, but I call it pre hell. But when I saw that place with these gates, I mean, it had to be 80, 80 feet tall, 50 to 80 feet tall gates, old rock, stone castles. I knew that was hell, hell. I knew for a fact, if I surpassed those gates, I'm not coming back. And so as I'm standing on the cliff, and that's why I want to tell people, when you're in hell, there's no fellowship. That's why this part, I want to make it clear that the Lord obviously gave us the opportunity because there was a long line of people in these chains, okay? And they were coming and they were walking on this path, but each on the side of them like guards, almost like prison guards, but they were demons. Just some of them big, some of them walking so these people wouldn't try to run off the path. And they were marching them towards the gates, to the gates. But one person noticed and looked up. Now I'm thinking that the person noticed the Lord behind us. And, but then gave them an opportunity to start screaming towards us. Don't come here. Don't. They were screaming in all different languages. And I'm looking at the people on this side, looking at the people on this side, the cliff, and they were screaming. Don't. They were like giving us utter warnings. Like, don't, please. They were begging to not come, to not come. And when I, you can feel the sincerity and the fear and the terror, like I, it is beyond. Just by looking at that place and hearing them, I knew. I said, my next step is I'm about to be down there in that chain, that chain gang heading on that path but all of a sudden it was just like a the same force of a swish because around when I, I went to different compartments in hell it was like i was teleporting it was like, boom boom he was taking me so now i know that was the lord showing me but all of a sudden i felt that same back and but when i came i got slammed into my body and i was i was in the hospital okay how how long how long did it feel like it was you said it's timeless right but did you how long did it feel? Did it feel like you were there for a long time? I feel like I was there for months. I feel like I was there for months. Wow. It felt like I was there for months. Like earth months, like our months. It felt Our months here on earth. It felt like wow. I was there for months. And I was only wow. there for like three minutes and 40 some seconds, 47 seconds. Wow. So you were, your wife said you were pronounced clinically dead. Three right? minutes and 47 seconds. What was the most uh, memorable thing maybe that happened during that time in hell when you were being, you know, showing different things that you want to share? What sticks out to me, all of it, all of it to me was equally, but what sticks out in my mind was, I call it the human shish kebab, where the giants were taking these big rusty poles and they were taking humans and they were taking them from underneath and they were putting them on these poles, like four or five at a time. And then they were carrying them around. Like they put these spears through them. These spears are huge. And they would take the body and they would poke you through and they would stuff you and they would stuff another one on top of you and they would stuff another one while you're screaming and moving and then they would pick you up and I don't even know where they were carrying them. But to me, I still even get visual. I still visualize it. I can still feel it. I can still smell the atmosphere. But to me, you know, besides uh, the females getting raped, the men's getting their genitals cut off, the sexual torture, and I call it the human shish kebab torture. To me, it really, 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 those are the two that really stick out to me, really much so. So in terms of senses, right? So I want to give people like a sense of maybe like what, is it like a like a day's feeling like you're in like a, a dream-like state or is it like very vivid or mm -hmm. do you feel like, or you feel now like, 
how, 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 what's it like, like a dream state? Have or... you ever had a dream? See, there's a difference between dreams and messages. Have you ever had a dream where when you first wake up, you're glad to be here and you look and say, whew, I'm glad that was, that was just a dream. So imagine that type of feeling magnetized times a thousand. It's more, it was, it's more realer than me experiencing talking to you right now. Wow. It's even hard. Like I say, there's no, there's certain emotions that I feel and we feel as human beings on a daily basis that you can't even put into words, right? The descriptive part, I'm just getting close to it as I can, because there's some things that I can't even fathom to put in a human language, any language. There's no words because everything there is so impactful and so powerful with energy. I can't even, I can't even calculate how people, yeah. And some people say it's fake, right? And that's the thing. When I read those comments, I, 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 I feel I'm just like, man, like, yeah. what, what do you have to say to people who don't believe? Like people okay. who hear stuff like this and they're like, oh, it's fake. But guess what? What do you say to them? The demons love that. The demons are clapping because the fact is they don't want you to believe so you can get there. See, hell does not need your belief. Hell doesn't need you. Actually, it don't want you to believe because how can you fight an enemy that you don't believe exists? That means you already lost. So they, 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 they want you. So listen, my job is just to deliver a message. I don't debate my experience. I don't have to debate it because one thing we all have in common as human beings, we're all going to die. I'm just telling you, I, I, the Lord told me I don't have to debate anything. My job is just to tell you my experience, my testimony. You people can do what they want to do with it. But I'm just telling you, like, for example, if, if you were from you in Japan right now, if you come yeah. to the United States and say, you know, the jails in the United States are not real. Well, go break the law. Watch what's going to happen. The jail that's waiting for you don't need you to believe in it. Mm. It's sitting there waiting for you. It's a cell with your name on it. Your, your little cot with your name on it. It don't need you to believe in it. So people who I want to say that they don't want you to believe. So I ask you, I ask you, I don't, you know, like I tell people all the time, there's 1.8 and some more million gods that are worshiped on this earth. Okay. Why is it that our Lord and our father, God, especially Jesus Christ is the only one picked on? Why is he the only one mocked? Why is he the only one out of 1.8 million known gods that are worshiped? Why is he the only one made into a curse word? Why is he the only one so disrespected? Because he's the truth. That's why. Plain and simple. I don't argue no more with people. I don't have to. They take his salvation. They take his messages. For, oh, trust me. Everybody's going to be held accountable. I'm not here to scare anyone. But one thing that, especially in the Proverbs says, fear is the beginning of wisdom, right? The fear of God. Fear of God, yeah. The yeah. fear of God is the beginning. So if it scares you enough to at least research yourself, what do you have to lose by praying and say, hey, show me. Show me, Lord. If you're really real, show me that you're real. What do you have to lose? But for all the naysayers, hey, that's your, hey, I don't violate your free will just like our Lord. I'm not here to force you to believe. I'm not, I'm not here to debate with you. I'm just telling you. I'm just passing on the message. Like the UPS man, what does he do? He delivers your package and he leaves. Whatever you do with the package is up to you. That's it. So I, I know we're, we're kind of wrapping up, but I, I want you to talk about when you came back, you came back into your body. I want mm -hmm. you, to talk, you, you, you to talk about that and then how you actually met Jesus and, you know, became a pastor, et cetera. I want that mm -hmm. part of the story as well. Yeah. Well, when I came back into my body, like I said, it, it felt disgusting. I felt horrible. I felt like I was wearing it. It felt like if you put on like three outfits that were dipped in cold water, that's, that's, a, that's the best way I can describe it. It felt like I was literally wearing my body. I was wearing it like I'm wearing an outfit and I felt nasty. It took a, it took a while for me to get rid of that for a couple of weeks for me to get rid of that nasty feeling because I was, yeah, it, it was, it's weird. But, um, so you were in the hospital when you woke up in the hospital or mm -hmm. yeah, I was in the hospital and the nurses were freaking out. Everybody was freaking out because they pretty much just gave up. They were wrapping it up. I can tell the machines were outside. They were just pretty much wrapping everything up. Like, cause I was done. It, it was, so it where was, were you shot? Where were you shot? In my stomach. Twice. Okay. Twice. In my abdomen. Okay. That's why I'm still I'm still experiencing medical conditions right now. I still have fragments of bullets in me. I may have to have an upcome. So those who are believers, you can pray. My surgery goes well. I really appreciate that because I have to have some bullet fragments removed from my intestines, from my uh, small intestines still, because they're starting to wow. rust and iodize in my stomach. So, yeah. And
and your wife said that they said you wouldn't walk, but you you started walking yeah. miraculously. I still, even to this day, I still have complications of walking. But they told me I wouldn't walk again correctly. I wouldn't walk at all. But now I'm walking right now. You know, I still walk with a limp. It still hurts when the weather changes. A lot of people know what that means. Like when it rains, when it snows, it's a lot of tremendous pain because I have permanent nerve damage. But that's better than being paralyzed. So thank the Lord. He he gave me the ability. I'm walking again. So yeah, but they told me I would never walk again. So we're gonna pray indeed, yep. right? So yeah. um, so you, you you got up on the bed, um, you were probably screaming, telling them she said you said like yeah, I, you were screaming and then I was screaming, like I didn't first of all, the same way, just as fast as I left was just as fast as I came back. Two different dimensions, like two boom. After that swoosh, and it was pink, pink, and I'm just I was so beyond confused is, is an understatement. Okay, but Looking at the nurse's face made me more scared because she was looking at me with, and she ran out the room. So I'm like, "Hey, what's you know what's going on?" You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and I was scared, I, and I didn't want to go back. So I'm screaming, "Don't let me go back, please! Don't somebody, no help! What what's going on? Like, don't let me go back because I can even still hear." In my heart, in my mind, I can still smell hell. I can still, you know, so me being there, I just thought any second now I was going to be taken back there. Okay. Did you see what I mean? It's the most scariest feeling ever, you know. Did, then, did he share it with anyone? Did he share the story when you got up afterwards or you kept it to yourself for many years? I, I, kept, I kept it to myself uh, for, for a minute, you know. I, honestly, I, I truly did because, first of all, it took a while for me to even – grasp that's that's how serious it is that's how powerful it is it took so long for me to even digest it and it it, it had the opposite effect at first it gave me post-traumatic stress syndrome with disorder i mean to the point where i started drinking more when i came back because of that hell experience it had the reverse effect at first it wasn't like the lord i came from hell and all of a sudden i was just with the no 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 it had uh, uh, the reverse effect at first I was so traumatized by it, it led me to drinking more. Even after the experience I experienced, you would think I would have woken up and just said, hey, no more. No, I was, it made me very scared of a lot of things, different noises. Like I say, even to this day, I can't stand the smell of those matches. I can't do it. I can't, it just really brings me right back, you know? And that's why it took me a long time to come out because the Lord had to give me the energy and the strength to even rehash this story because just thinking about it. That's how horrible it is. I had to have, this is his strength for me to be able to explain this without me having anxiety problems. Because just, just remembering, I can see it. I can still smell the smells. I can still just, you know, so I know it's him helping me tell this story, but how, yeah, go ahead. So how, how did you now move from that place to actually becoming a believer? And I think your wife said you also um, have a, a degree as well, like a pastoral degree. Uh, so talk, talk to us about when you decided to start a ministry and follow mm-hmm. Jesus, like fully. Well, yeah, um, a couple of years ago, I did get my pastoral ship. It was about three and a half years ago, uh, National Christian Church University. Um, but see, only reason why I did that is because I wanted to, I already started my street ministry a long time ago. It had no name. It had nothing. I was just out there trying to preach the word. Okay. And what I had to get my credentials for, which I thought was to be able, because I wanted to speak at other jails. I wanted to speak around, but they said, where's your credentials? I'm like, wait a minute. Why do I have to have credentials? I got credentials. I'm a believer. See, that's how I know this system is fake. You know, what, what, did Paul and them have credentials? Right. Did the apostles and the, the disciples? No, they didn't. Their credentials was their experience. But now these days, yeah, let me see these documents. So I got it just to appease so I can go to different jails and go to different things. And roughly, we just started this full ministry, I would say roughly about, what is it, six months ago, five to six months ago, am I correct? Yeah, yeah, about five, six months ago to start going. Because before that, I was still, we were out on the streets praying, passing out Bibles. But then the Lord put it on my heart, just like he put it on my heart. Now it's time for you to give your testimony it's time for you to organize this now so you can bring more sheep into the fold. So now you can do more things and, and get the word out there. How long after you uh, had the experience, you started street ministry and started to say, you know what, I'm going to take this seriously and, and uh, start evangelizing, etc. It took It took about a good 14 years. Wow. So 14 years before you started street ministry? Mm-hmm. 
So that yeah. whole time you were, were you grappling with uh, your relationship with Jesus? You were, you were trying to figure things out. What happened between uh, that time? He, he was building his relationship with me. I started to change instantly. I mean, I, I started to notice the change in my attitude, the people I was hanging with. So I, I started to see the instant changes. I definitely started to change. But people don't understand. The same way there are different levels of fear in hell, there's <laughs> different levels of purity and maturity in the spirit. Mm -hmm. See? And also, I learned from experience, you only rise as high as your faith. Okay? You only yeah. rise and you're only as powerful as your faith. Okay? Yeah. And you're only as powerful as how much you know him personally. So True. he developed. He took his time with me. So now it is concrete. It is mm -hmm. concrete. It is a part of every fiber of my being. It's a part of my character now because I didn't rush the process. Mm -hmm. I accepted it. My foundation is solid now. I didn't want to rush it because of my experience. I, I was authentic. That's why I'm, I'm authentic. I'm bold. I'm courageous. Yeah. I have nothing to hide from anyone because I know him personally now. See, like yeah. I told people before, there's the idea, people love the idea of God. They love the idea of our Lord. That's not loving him. Hmm. Then compared to having a real relationship loving him, everyone loves the idea of him and they think they love him, but they don't. I'm just being honest. So it took those years to really develop a true, authentic relationship. Mm -hmm. That's why he tells you, peace be still. Be still. Do it the right way. Don't just rush and be scared and frightened. No, ask him to come and he will guide you on your time. Some may get it faster than 14 years after uh, an experience, or some may get it without an experience. Every relationship is customized with him. Mm -hmm. It's unique as our fingerprint. Everybody has a unique fingerprint. Your relationship, he loves, he talks to me differently. He may talk to you. Everyone's relationship is different, but the love doesn't change. Amen. So I wanted to tell us about the uh, your ministry, the books, because I know you have two books and there's one yes. that's going to have the, this experience even in more detail. Yes. So tell us about your ministry yes. and the books and where we can find you as well. Sure, sure. Our parent ministry is called the Narrow Path Society. And we also have a ministry called Blessed to Be Chosen. You can reach us on blessedtobechosen.com. You can also email us at blessedtobechosen.com7 at gmail.com. Or you can email us at the Narrow Path Society at gmail.com. Also, my first book is on Amazon. It's called The Toughest Enemy You Have in Life is You. My second book is in Barnes & Noble. It's called Passport to Eternity. And my third book is coming out in two months, God willing. It's called Spiritual Currency. And it would detail all the things, the, the things that I can't talk about on here in much detail that I could possibly put into words of my hell experience and after. Um, also, we're doing a lot, a lot of great things, you guys. Um, Go to the website, www.blessedtobechosen.com. Uh, we're doing a lot of great things. Right now, we're, we're trying to um, make sure because we're connected with the international Bible givers where we get out. Uh, praise the Lord for them. They supply us with our Bibles so we can get enough Bibles to go pass out, you know, out to the streets. We pass out Narcans for those that are addicted. We're always looking for volunteers. You can give us a call. We have a prayer line and also a resource uh, call. Or if you wanted to set up an appointment to talk with me, it's area code 763-447-8562. And also we have a, a text to give number. It is 773, the text to give, text, T-E-X-T, -E the number two, give at 773-257-0061. And also you can join us uh, to join our group on Facebook. We have the Narrow Path Society on Facebook. Our members have been joining uh, great. We have a great fellowship, great ministry. So you all, everyone is welcome. All questions are welcome. Now, the, the, the foolish thing is if you don't ask questions, there's nothing wrong with questions. We're here to help God willing. And uh, I, I love you all, even believers and non-believers alike. But I just hope people give God a chance. Just pray and ask, what do you have to lose? You know, so please contact us, please, because we're doing a lot, a lot of great things. And you also have a YouTube channel as well, right? A new channel. Yes, that is uh, Dominic Morrow on YouTube. You can just go to YouTube. Wait, hold on. Here, come in. I want you to meet somebody as well. This is my IT guy here, hey, your brother up, in Christ. Hey. Hey, what's up? What's up, bro? I don't want to intrude or nothing like that, but it's Dominic Morrow, Inc. on YouTube. Uh, he's the first one that pops up. You know, we have the interviews, his music as well, and in the links in there as well. It also shows mm -hmm. like the drop down, the email questions, anything like that. Um, we'd be glad to hear from you as well. 
Right. All right. Thank, Thank you, so you, brother. Much. See, look, I, I'm right. so busy. He handles all of those things. So, yes, yes, that's, that's my brother in Christ right there. He's all right. Nice, good. nice. Do you want to, like, maybe pray us out and stuff? Maybe, you know, we'll pray for you, too, you know, regarding, like, your upcoming surgery and stuff like that. And yeah. then um, is that okay if I pray now? Sure, or, please. Or? Please do. I appreciate it very much so. Father, we come before you, Lord God, in the name of your Holy Son, Jesus Christ, our Father. And I thank you even now for this moment in time and for your son, Dominic, our Father. Indeed, you are the God that heals, Lord God. And there's no distance, indeed, in prayer. So I ask, oh God, that you will heal him and restore him completely, our Father, in the name of your Holy Son, Jesus Christ, our Father, that is a surgery that's coming up, our Father, that, that you'll make it successful, oh God, that even afterwards there will be no no residue of of, of uh, uh, shrapnel or bullets within him, our Father, and that He'll be able to walk fully and that there will be no, no more pain, Lord God, concerning it, when the weather changes, the, the, the rain, the snow, the cold, etc. That you, O oh God, Amen. in your mercy, in your love, in your goodness, in your grace, our Father, will grant him healing in Jesus' holy and everlasting name. And that that which, Lord God, you've called him to, you'll bring to fruition and to the fulfillment for your glory and the advancement of your way, your will, your kingdom. In Jesus' name, I thank you for this moment in time and for your brother, my brother, Lord God, your son. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.